with GT, uh, which is you know a great use of time in this workshop. Uh, yeah, it's kind of strange because the three hour workshop format, it's not great for like tons of like, you know, time to do, you know, group work or anything like that. And the package is unfortunately pretty big. Um, so there's lots of stuff to learn. And I do want you to learn quite a bit if you can absorb it all. Um, but luckily we do have everything that's in here in this repo right here uh, under my, you know, like my sort of like repo name and GT Workshop 2020. And there's even a link to the RStudio Cloud project, which is what I'm using right now. Uh, but otherwise, there's also a bunch of RMD files you can just download to your own you know, private RStudio desktop environment. Uh, so yeah, lots of ways to, uh, to learn here. You can you know, just watch if you like, or you can like, you know, get right into it and you know, um, basically like, you know, do the exercise along with me. Uh, so yeah, so basically we have uh, six RMDs. I'm going to start with the most basic one, which is creating a table. And we're going through a lot of functions in this package and they're split into families. So in each RMD, we're gonna focus on a specific family of functions. And each of these families does a certain thing, like has a, a certain sort of like uh, focus. The very first one is all starting with GT. Uh, it's basically how you make a table. It's kind of like the entry point. So all the GT tables, they begin with a call to the function GT. And what you supply to it is a data table. It could be a data frame. Or a table. They, they both work with just I'm showing, or all these arm markdown files. I'm showing the function, all the options, all the defaults. Uh, so it's a bit easy to, it's a bit easier to follow along. Okay, so let's look at one example. Well, first, let me tell you, uh, the GT package has quite a few data sets in it. And the idea is there is to, you know, use them to play around with the, with the API. Uh, the easiest to use is this one called Exibl. It's basically just a table, which is a few rows. The great, you know, advantage of having a small table like that is that it fits on a page. It's really easy to play around with, uh, you know, all the functions of GT with this because there's columns of different types. There's only a few rows. Uh, it just makes it easy to, to quickly see what functions do. So let's actually print out this table. I'm gonna run that right now. It's gonna take a second for this to become alive again. Uh, but it should here, there we go. So eight rows, seven columns. Uh, there's different types like number, character, factor, date, time, date time, currency. And this is great because we're gonna play around with different formatters in GT. So we're gonna learn how to format these values into sort of nice representations for a display table. Uh, so let's actually use GT and put pipe Exibl to the GT function. Great, so you see this has been transformed to this HTML table. Whenever you, um, you know, make calls to GT and use more functions, you'll see a preview either in here or most likely inside the viewer. Uh, it's only because we're in an R markdown file, we're gonna see it right below the, uh, the code chunk in the output area. So this is great. So we have number, character, it's all formatted with some very light formatting. Uh, it looks much like this. Of course, later on, we're going to uh, make this look a lot nicer and you know make it look the way you want it to look. So that's the basic layout. Uh, we get column labels and what we call here the, uh, the, the table body, which is basically all the cells, the data cells. So there's a few more things we can do just inside the GT function itself. We can, of course, pipe it again to GT, but we can specify a row name call. So what that does is it'll make a, something called a stub. It's a little hard to explain, it's better to see it. So I'm just gonna run this. And a stub is essentially is a set off area to the left. It doesn't have a, a column label. Yeah, that, there's actually a spot here that where you, you actually could put a label in. Uh, but the idea is that it, this is really, basically meant for labels. You're basically labeling the data with row labels. Uh, so that's what the stub is. And you can make that right, right at the beginning with uh, this row name call and you specify which column you want to be in the stub. Okay. Um, so there's more. Uh, we can do something called splitting the data into row groups. 
So we see right here, we have a column called group and as a categorical value, group A and group B. So we can use this and we can split the data into two, two different groups. Uh, so right inside the GT function, we can specify group name call and using the column group, we can do this. So what it does is it creates a, a row group label above each row and it'll put all the rows that belong to each group inside you know, the appropriate areas below. So this forms a group. And the nice thing is like, this can be out of order. It'll just collect them, put them in the order that, you know, preserves some order, but it basically collects all the different rows into the different groups, uh, which is kind of nice. You don't have to think about it too much. Uh, so yeah, so that's how you create a stub and row groups just with the GT function and a simple table to be on it. Okay, um, so let's have an example here where we take, you know, sort of proving the point that if you have rows in a weird order, so we can just sample some rows. We could just run this and we'll see that, you know, it's all mixed up, you know, each time we do it, it's gonna be like that. But if we do run this, we'll see that it is collected into group A and group B. This might be in a different order, but some order is preserved. So that's how that works. Uh, okay, so what if you have like a sort of an old school data frame with row names, like empty cars has that. So I'll just you know, show you empty cars to refresh your memory. So these are actually row names um, in the data frame. So it has that feature. It's not, it's a little bit discouraged these days to have that, but sometimes you may have that. So what you can do is you can use an option. If you wanna keep those and put them in the stub, you can just use this option, row names to stub equals true. Let's sort of run this. And yeah, so we're essentially keeping those row names. We're not removing them. We're just gonna put them into the stub. And you have to enable this with true. Uh, by default, it's false. Okay, uh, I'm gonna keep moving on. Um, if you use dplyr a lot, we have this option to group data uh, just with the group by function. Um, it has sort of a secondary use in GT where you can group by certain columns and then uh, use that to create row groups. So we're gonna group by group the column and then uh, we're gonna specify the stub. So this is kind of similar to before where we just used, you know, like group call and specify that. In this case, we're just pre-grouping the data and putting it into uh, to the GT function right there. So it understands grouped data. So you can do things, you can group by two different things if you want. You can group by uh, group and we'll just say, it's gonna be silly because it's gonna be one row groups, but we'll do date time as well. And then we'll put that in. So what it's doing is it's collapsing groups. So it does a group of these two things, makes one row group and it keeps going all the way down. These are all unique. But if you had two categoricals in two columns, you could do this and it would actually be a pretty nice table if you did that. Okay, so I'm gonna keep moving on. Um, so Pizza Place is another data set inside GT. It's kind of huge. It's almost 50,000 rows. So you definitely don't want to, um, you know, make a table out of that. It's gonna be a giant table. It's gonna, probably gonna crash your studio session. So not a good idea. Uh, but what you can do, oops, sorry. Computer's going crazy. Uh, what you can do is you can use dplyr and uh, you know, do some interesting things beforehand before you actually get to the GT uh, function. So if we do this, we'll just show you what you get. You get 18 rows. We're essentially now just filtering out certain types of pizza, grouping by type and size. <clears throat> and for each of the groups, we're just getting three from each group and you know, putting them at a table. It's kind of a silly example. You can do better stuff with summarize, but this is just to show you that um, you know, dplyr before using GT, it's a good thing. You probably want to do that. You want to get the table into the shape that you generally want before it introduce, you introduce into GT. Oh, and the cool thing here I wanted to show you, which is different, is you have grouped data here. It's still being preserved. Uh, you can set a separator uh, between the row groups. Let me just show you that because it makes no sense otherwise. So this right here, this double slash is going to be the separator between the two different groups. So in this case, we're creating actual groups, which are, you know, have more than one item each. Um, but this allows you to sort of control the formatting a little bit uh, right inside the GT function. 
Okay, uh, this is a lot of stuff right away. Any questions so far? You can feel free to blurt it out. I don't mind. It's actually not a bad thing at all. Or the chat box is always a good thing. Uh, yeah, but this is maybe pretty basic stuff until you get to the things like grouping. It gets a little more complex. Ooh, why is a dplyr function written dplyr? Excellent question. Uh, this is just like safety. Um, there's been many times where you don't have, you know, you didn't use library dplyr or library tidyverse, and you just want to use the functions from dplyr without using library. You can do this, and it's also to show you that this is not from GT. In case you're not familiar with dplyr, it's just it's coming from dplyr. Uh, so this is fine. Uh, this is also fine as long as you do library tidyverse, library dplyr at the beginning. Okay, uh, next function, GT preview. This is kind of a one-off function where it, you have a data set, you just want to get a preview of it. It's kind of like using head or summary in you know base R. Uh, you just want to see the, the table, but only a part of it so it fits on the screen. Uh, so you can use GT preview. And it has some pretty good defaults which you can change. Top end, bottom end. Imagine you have a large data set, you know, maybe not that large, but a thousand rows. You're not going to print out, you know, a thousand row GT table. That's too big. Uh, but you just want the top five rows and maybe the bottom one row. Um, so let's try that with uh, GT cars. It's another data set which is inside GT. It's kind of like empty cars, but they're newer cars. And we're going to select just a few columns, like so. So manufacturer model year. And we're going to get a preview. It's 47 rows, but the preview will be smaller. Yeah, so it shows you the first, it numbers the rows too. So you have some sense of, you know, some sense of place in the data set. So the first five rows, the last row, and shows you what rows are sort of not being shown, sort of in an ellipsis, uh, which is great. It's a one-off thing. You can't really do much beyond this, but it's great if you just have a data set. You got GT, you know, on your computer, you just want to get a quick preview of the data set. This is probably where you, where you, where you want to go. Um, yeah, there's a few customization options too. Not many. If you don't want to include the row numbers, you can just do this. So here's another data set called SP500. Also pretty huge, you know, over 16,000 rows. Um, in this case, we're seeing the top five, top and bottom five, and we're not including the row numbers. Okay, um, so that's GT and GT preview. Now let's look at GT save. No underscore this time. Um, it's modeled after ggsave in, if you ever used ggplot, it has a function which is similar. Um, and even the way it's sort of like laid out here is pretty similar to ggplot. So what you do is you um, use that at the end. So let me just show you, I'll get a table here. Uh, let's take a look at this table. Okay, the same table we've seen before. Uh, so we have that table and we want to save it. So we can do that with gtsave. The way you do that is you specify a file name and just by the extension, and there's only a few supported types as well, just by the extension, uh, we get that file. So if you put in tab underscore one underscore inline dot HTML, it makes an HTML file. So let's actually run that. And it actually appears here. I mean, unless you have a use for HTML, uh, you know, you're probably not gonna use this. So, uh, you might so like gtsave.png if you want like, um, you know, a PNG file, like a picture of the table, which could be good in some cases. I got a question here saying, I assume RTF would be the most MS Word compatible. Yes, um, if you do run this and we get the RTF file, I'm gonna click it and see where it opens. Okay, apparently it downloads from our Studio Cloud. Um, can I drag that to Word? Maybe. I just kind of want to prove that Word works. Okay, let's see if this works. Um, I'm gonna drag this into Word. It doesn't understand it because it doesn't have the file extension. Um, so just cause this is a weird sort of RCO cloud thing, usually it ends off when you make the file, it'll have RTF, it'll have the file name you want, but we'll just see this. No, okay. RCO cloud, not so great. <laughs> <laughs> but if you did this locally, it would be just fine. You'd have a RTF file, which would open Word. 
you create the document, there'll be one table in there. And uh, then you can just take that table and put it elsewhere. So in the future, what we want to have is actually a, um, a sort of word native table format where you can just use it in a Word document in R Markdown, which would be a lot more convenient. Uh, but there was a huge sort of use case just for RTFs. So that's why this was done first. Uh, but for now, you can just you can definitely take that table and plop it in to your Word document. Got another question, can you knit to Word uh, with GT tables? Unfortunately not right now. That's the thing that needs to be done next. Um, unfortunately, there's two different formats. There's RTF and there's a sort of like the nerd, the Word native table, which is based on XML. And that has to be done um, in the upcoming project. Uh, yeah, you can definitely copy a table to the clipboard and paste into Word. Even in these tables here, um, if I were to take one of these, you can probably not copy it from, yeah, right here. This is copy and pasteable into Word and it would actually preserve all the, um, all the borders for as much as possible, I think. Sort of understands that. Let's try it out, shall we? I mean, we're all learning things here. I'll make a blank document. Paste. I mean, not great. You can probably fix this up a little bit. Margins are kind of like huge, but this is its best guess. Um, probably the way to go is use RTF because um, the margins aren't hyperinflated. You can actually get a more readable table. But if you don't mind, you know, playing around with some formatting, this is not terrible either. Okay. So that is GT safe. Uh, so formats can be HTML, RTF, PNG, and PDF. Um, here's a little summary at the bottom. Um, that concludes the first module, which is basically this RMD. It's kind of a quick one to get going. Uh, the other ones are a, a bit, you know, there's a bit more to them. But this is kind of like the foundation. You, you just want to use the GT function to start things off. Yes. Yes, Flextable actually has like native knitting to, to Word. Um, so that's, that, if you really need that, that's what you need to, that's what you need to use. Okay, we're gonna go on to our next um, module, which is adding or modifying parts of a table. So in this part, we have a huge number of functions <clears throat> to add parts to the table. And they all begin with the tab tab underscore. So you have functions like tab stubhead, tab spanner, tab header, so on and so forth. But there's more uh, of these select helpers. If you ever use dplyr, you probably run to these, uh, you know, contains, starts with, ends with. These are used to select columns. So you can, you know, have starts with, and then in quotes, you know, A or B. Any column starting with B will be selected and considered in the function. Everything chooses everything, which is a great thing to use sometimes. And we have these helpers for transforming text. MD stands for markdown. HTML is if you're wanting to use HTML tags right inside you know, some bit of text that you want to put into the table. No, unfortunately, we don't have a cross yet. Uh, that's a bit too new. <laughs> We're going to wait a little bit until that gets um, you know, a bit more stable. And then we may, we'll probably like include a cross and some new tidy about idioms into GT because this is sort of like tidy about from like a year ago or two years ago. Um, but some other functions we have are those ones that begin with cells. So what we're doing here is we're targeting certain cells and we're gonna apply something to those cells. We'll see that later. These functions either work with tab style, which is where you style cells, or tab footnote is where you would apply a footnote uh, to a certain cell, and then there'll be the note at the bottom of the table, you know, as footnotes often work. And maybe confusingly, we have these helpers for defining styles. They begin with cell, not cells, but cell, cell text, cell fill, cell borders. This is where you would put in like, you know, text styling options, you know, fill, it's a color fill options and uh, defining borders for different cells. So let's jump into um, 
maybe a little bit of a boring one, tab stub head. It's that little empty area in the top left corner when you have a stub. You basically have nothing there. This allows you to put something there. You can put a label in there. But um, even though this is a little bit boring, it can show us that you can use things like markdown or other things to, to make that label a little bit more interesting. So let me just show you this. Um, so we've got the GT cars data set. We're going to make that a bit more, well, not as big as GT cars is, five rows. We're going to pipe that into GT, uh, where the row name, the stub includes the models of cars. And tab stub head, we're going to include the label car. So let's have a look at this. There you go. So that's the stub head right here. That's the label. And we can do things like, you know, use markdown, like so. So we can do things like make this bold. Do the run. Okay, great. That is bold right there. Uh, we can make it set in italics. And, uh, you know, do other sort of markdown y things um, that you can possibly fit right there. And you can also use HTML. Um, so we can do things like strong, same as bold. So there you have it. So you can, with any, any times you want to put in some text into the table that's not you know, part of the original table, usually it's around the table. We can use these uh, helper functions to you know, do a bit more with the text. So that's, uh, that's tab stub head. Um, allows you to put something in there if you need it into that top left corner. Okay, so I'll go on to the next function. This is a bit more interesting. It's called tab spanner. So you can add one or have one level of spanning column labels across multiple columns. And uh, to do that, we specify the label in the columns that we want to put the label across. And we have this other option called gather, which is pretty interesting. What it does is it'll take columns, move them into place if they're you know, not adjacent to each other. And we specify you know, a spanner over top of them. This will just grab all those columns and put them together. Kind of like how the rows were sort of like put together in row groups. Same sort of principle, except for working the other way. Um, <clears throat> so because we have a columns argument, we can use all these, uh, you know, tie sledge expressions like contains, matches, starts with. Um, and with when you're specifying columns, you can either use the double quotes, you know, like C and multiple columns with double quotes, or you can put all the columns in bars which is a little bit nicer because we don't have to put quotes around all the column names. So let me show you this. Um, so I'm going to take GT cars, make it small, right? So eight rows of a table. And then I'm going to just take a look at this in GT. So th this is like the beforehand shot of the table. So just a, just a plain table. It's got a stub. It's got some columns. But we want spanners above at least some of these columns. So we're going to do that next. Um, we'll use tab spanner and we'll have the label performance over these columns, HP, torque, MPG, all these ones here. And uh, we're just going to run this and we shall see performance does go over top of those. And the interesting thing is, actually no, it's not very interesting because they're all sort of in a row. There's no sort of like gathering at all. So, but it's interesting that this does appear above all those, which is great. And uh, say you want another spanner above year and body style, you would just call this again uh, with a different label and different columns being called. Um, another cool thing. Uh, so we can use these tidy, tidy select statements. Uh, the key to make them, you know, to use multiple of them, you just use C. So, it's, you know, we have things that starts with HP, they start with TRQ, they start with MPG. We should get the same table. I mean, you're probably not saving much room, but this might be handy in you know, one or two cases where you, know, you want to do this. OK, so um, say, for instance, we have the HP column at the beginning. You want to relocate to the far left. Uh, well, the associated columns are gathered together because columns are true. So let me show you that um, HP. There we go. 
So what's going on there? Uh, what's happening is we're selecting just HP and then everything else. So to see what's going on, we have to take a look at this. So this is a sort of a way, an older way of, you know, using dplyr to move a column and then, you know, putting other columns, you know, the same other columns, you know, beyond it. There's a better way now to do that, but this also works pretty well. But the idea here is that uh, HP is now separated from HP RPM, torque, which would be under a spanner. So right now it's just being yanked over to the left. That's what's happening here in the end because gallery equals true. Uh, question, can you wrap and or rotate column headers? Unfortunately, not at this point. Um, well, you could, but it's a little more complicated. It's not um, available in the, in the GT through, through, through a function call. Um, but you can do it with, by modifying CSS later on. Of course, that won't be very satisfying if, you're, you, know, if you want to make something like a, an RTF file. Uh, but there is actually a, um, there's actually a function that allows you to do all sorts of things to CSS. And rotating is one of those things that you can do. OK, so this is uh, all about making a spanner and how it gathers columns. I'm going to show you another function here, tab header. And this one deals with putting a, a title, basically a header above the GT table. Uh, and you can, there's a, you know, an option to have a title and a subtitle. And uh, subtitle, of course, is optional. But the idea is that the title is a little bit larger than the subtitle. Uh, but of course, things like sizes can be modified later. This is just a sort of like a good sort of default. So let's do the beforehand table, just so we can see the table before we get a header. Looks just like this. Um, all the columns are sized to the to the contents. So when we do have a, head, a header, it'll probably be much larger than this. So it'll sort of stretch the table out. Um, but you can always size a table any way you like it uh, with functions that you'll see later. Uh, but for now, let's take a look at tab header. And we'll use markdown to style the, you know, the, the statements. So we're just using the title data listing from GT cars and you know, GT cars using these back ticks gives it the code font is an R data set. So let's run this. And there you go. Um, and this is just like the defaults. Later on, you can style, you know, you can make this, you know, align to the left if you like, change the sizes, that's all possible. But, but just with this, this is a good starting point. You get a pretty decent title and subtitle. Uh, source note. So a source note is pretty much like a footnote, except it doesn't have a glyph that associates it with any single part of the table. It's just a, a note at the bottom. MD can be combined with glue. Absolutely, yes. You can put a glue statement in here. And you don't have to as character it. It'll just be fine with MD and glue inside. That's totally good. And you can take basically any, you know, interpolate any objects from you know, the global environment into the, the label. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Um, source notes, yeah. So basically, they're just notes at the bottom of the table. They go into a certain area in the footnotes, sort of the footer section. And they live alongside the, the, the footnotes, which may or may not be specified. But I think they go first. Um, and maybe that falls some sort of common convention. I usually see source notes first and then footnotes afterwards if they're together. So let's have a look at this. Uh, source note, great. We have to scroll to see the source note. There it is. The Exhibible data set is available in the GT package. Oh, the thing is, um, it doesn't look too great. It looks like we have markdown, but we're not actually using the markdown uh, helper function. So let's put that in. There we go. Run that again, now scroll down. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, uh, this is a place where you, you're putting in your own text. It's not part of the, the table itself. So you have an opportunity to style it any way you like with MD or HTML. And uh, you can do all sorts of things that you normally do with text. You can use any functions you like, as long as it evaluates to, to some you know, character string here. Oops, OK, there we go. OK, footnotes. Um, this is where it gets a bit more evolved because it's not just a note at the bottom of the table, it's actually an association with some part of the table. 
So we have to use those cells functions to sort of like, you know, specify where do we want, what does this footnote correspond to? What part of the table? So there's lots of these because uh, lots of different parts of the table. Uh, we have, you know, the title area, the stub head, uh, the spanners, the call labels, the row groups, the stub, the body cells. Uh, the summary, we haven't seen that yet, or the grand summary, we'll see that later. Uh, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to target or have a way to target any part of the table and apply a footnote so we can describe, you know, in some detail what, you know, plain that, plain that needs to be described. Um, and uh, we could do fancier things. It's not so relevant with footnotes because you, you mainly want to have them on just a few spots. Maybe not, um, but more with styles. You, you want to select maybe a bunch of different locations at one time and then just you know, apply style. Uh, you can do that by enclosing different cells calls within the list. Okay, let's start simply. Let's uh, start with you know, just exhibit being used in a GT table like so. And uh, we want to say for this label right here, factor, we want to put a footnote saying that this is a factor column. Okay, so we do that with the cells column labels function inside locations. So tap footnote only has two arguments, the footnote itself and a locations argument. And so for this, we need cells column labels because we want to target one of the column labels. And we just have to give it the column itself inside the columns argument. So let's try that. Okay, so we get the first one right here. Uh, just a one, it's in italics. And uh, that's great. And we do get the footnote at the bottom. This is a factor column. And of course, this is just a footnote. We can do this, which is great. Just to prove that it all works. Here we go, let's run this. Great. So it changed the, the actual note a little bit. Uh, so the great thing about um, footnotes <clears throat> in GT is you can specify, you know, lots of these happen in a different order. You don't have to worry about the order. You have multiple footnotes on the same location. It'll do the right thing, have an order. Um, basically, there's no manual stuff to do. You just add calls or tab footnote. Let me add one more. So we get some, some practice in or some demonstration. So we'll do it to um, apricot. Um, this is an, because I have no creativity this morning, I'll just say this is an apricot. Okay, so in this case, we'll want cells body, and it has different arguments, uh, columns and rows. So we're gonna do columns are and rows. You can put an expression here, but I'm just going to do the number one. I know it's not the best way of doing it, but it's not bad. And there we go. Apricot is there, number two. And, um, you know, we can do this as well. That's totally fine. It doesn't matter what order it's in. You should get the same result. And like I said, you can coalesce a number of different glyphs on the same location. It'll separate them by commas. They'll be in the right order. Um, there should be no, no problems with footnotes is, is what I'm trying to say. Um, okay, tab style. It's kind of similar to tab footnote, even though it doesn't seem like it, because it has um, locations, it has an extra style argument, uh, but it uses locations, which is kind of the key thing. Uh, so with tab style, we can target you know, certain cells and apply styles to them. And we do that with you know these functions: cell text, cell fill, cell borders. So yeah, we have locations. So this is the second function that uses these cells functions, just like tab footnote. So let's try that. Uh, let's try uh, this table right here. I always like to give you a before table. It's a very simple two-column table, some numbers, some currency, and uh, we'll use tab style. So we'll say uh, cell text. And the entire body should be times new row. Great. So it affects just the body, not the uh, column labels, which is kind of cool. Uh, but you could do that too. Do list cell uh, column labels, and you can do you know something like columns equals everything. 
that's great, comma, closing parenthesis. That should work. No, it does not work. Um, maybe this will work. <laughs> okay, so this does not work, <laughs> but normally it would work. Oh, it's because I, I put in the wrong area. I'm so sorry. Uh, this should be, sorry, Rich is not on the ball today. It should be here. I got confused because it said cell text. There we go. And cell text here, we'll restore it back to the way it was. Okay. That thankfully does work. <laughs> um, so yeah, so locations should just be cells. Uh, style should be cell underscore something. As you can see, it's a little bit confusing, but um, once you practice a bit, it shouldn't be so bad. Great. Uh, so the fonts you may have in your system may not be so exciting. Uh, you may want to use, take advantage of some fonts from the Google font service. And uh, we can do that with the Google font function. We can use that right inside cell text uh, in the font argument. So instead of font being uh, something that's on your system, we can say Google font and, uh, you know, use one of the fonts they have in their system. And we have a function to see which, you know, which fonts are available. I'll show you that shortly. Uh, but let's try this. So we're going to apply, well, you haven't seen this yet, it's a formatter, but let's just run this. So we formatted all these as currencies. And more importantly, inside the cell body uh, cells, we're using the Google font called IBM Plex Sans, uh, which is pretty nice. And we're applying a weight. So this is a, a numbered weight that's usually in hundreds. The lower you go, the lighter it is. We can, we can go to 200, I think. And uh, can we go as high as, depends on the font, but we can go up to 900 or even higher in some cases. So that's, uh, that's Google font. Uh, so I was telling you, I mentioned before that you can see some fonts. Uh, I'll just go to the console. I have a function here called info Google fonts. If you just run that as it is, it'll appear in the viewer. It just gives you a few recommendations because it's very overwhelming what Google fonts has. It's well over a thousand fonts. Uh, but at least this gives you like a few sort of curated examples of different types of fonts you can use. Otherwise you just go to, you know, fonts.google.com and, you know, browse their, their huge collection of fonts. And uh, as long as you get the name right, it should, Absolutely work in here. Okay. Um, so let's have a little more practice adding styles. I'll move this out of the way because it's a little bit distracting. This will come down. I can get it down. There we go. Uh, so let's make another GT table with Exhibit. So let's add some more styles that could be, are applied to data cells that satisfy some sort of condition. So. Let's start with this. Let's just take a look and see how it looks before we apply the style. Just a standard table. And this is a little bit different. Um, so what we're doing here is we're enclosing in the list some fill style, you know, color cyan, and then a text style, changing the weight to bold. Uh, but not only that, in the locations, we're specifying cells body. And the column is the num column. But in this case, we just want to target the rows where the number, you know, is above 5,000. So we'll get these being styled in this case. And then we're doing it again. We're passing this to another tab style um, statement, which has, you know, different fill and text styles. And in this case, we're doing another um, styling of uh, cell, body, uh, cell body cells in the currency column where the currency is less than 100. So it'll just be like this one, this one, and these. Okay, so let's have a look at this. There we are. So this is a way of conditionally styling uh, cells in a, in a column. So we can apply um, the style to just those ones that where this is true. Okay. Yeah, and if you wanted to do multiple uh, columns and you had maybe you know a different condition, you just wrap this up in the list and uh, do multiple calls of cells body. 
how would you move columns with NA from your table? Excellent question. And the next, uh, the next module will have a, a function just for that called format missing. And you can replace NAs with uh, any bit of text that you want. It can be like a, a hyphen, M dash, you know, a blank, like nothing. Uh, it's really quite nice. And you're gonna, it's a, you just, you know, use it across all columns if you like to. Okay, so that's a tab style. Uh, there's even more here. Uh, but I think we, I think you kind of get the point. Well, why is it keep doing that? <laughs> uh, I think you get the point. Uh, so what we're trying to do is use tab style locations. This is just using more conditional styling. I'm going to show it because it's kind of cool. You can sort of see where it's going. Um, we got a bit of a table, and entire rows are being are being uh, colored, either light green or or tomato, uh, depending on what's in the row. Okay. Um, we're going to take a break pretty soon. I probably should have had that now. I just want to show you one more function. We're going to show one example, tab options. This is kind of like, whole, like um, an option for the entire table. It's a huge function in terms of like the options you're given. Uh, most of the time you don't need to use this, but if, you, if you're aware that it exists and you want to you know, change one tiny, tiny detail of the table, this is where you would go. Um, so I'm just going to show you really quickly. Um, do we have a tab options call in here? Oh yeah, okay. So we're going to take a table and we're just going to have a look at it. This is like the, the before table with no options applied. But it looks pretty nice. We got you know a lot of things in here. We have footnotes, a header. Uh, we have like you know a stub, row groups. It's all very nice. Um, now we want to modify it so the table width is 100%. You know, it's a bit scrunched, you know, just, you know, to the middle. Maybe you want to give it some breathing room so we can do table width 100%. So that this PCT helper is used here. So it'll just expand it to the, the width of the container. And of course, we can, do, we can do PX as well. And then specify, you know, say we want 500 pixels. That can be done. And we can just, you know, keep going until it looks nice. That sort of thing. So that's one option here. It's just table width. Um, the other option is the table background color. We can make that, say, light cyan. A little hard to see here, but you know, it's definitely sort of like a, a nice light cyan color. Um, if you don't like, you know, numbers for your footnote glyphs, you can use letters. So that's what this does here. So instead of having it, you know, being one here and two there, it's now A and B. Uh, we can change padding, uh, sorry, padding of data rows to five pixels. So this makes it a bit more compressed. It's better in some cases, have less padding. You want to have more information density. You can definitely lower the amount of data row padding with that. Is there more? Of course, there's lots. Um, so we can change the, the size of the, of the heading, uh, title and subtitle. Uh, so it's small. It's a little hard to know that beforehand. Of course, there's help inside the document and also on the online site. Uh, to give you all the options here, um, but you know we can do have a px size as well. So there's lots of ways to specify the size. Uh, that's about it um, for this whole sort of like section. I want to give you like a 10 minute break just to you know relax, practice, you know, look at some things. Um, I have a file here. If you're following along, it's called this. Uh, 02z practice one two. If you just look at that, it has you know some things you can play around with. You can add things in here. Uh, it gives you some some chance to play around. You can do that if you like. You can do that later. You can ask me questions now. I'm just going to stop talking, but answer questions if you have them. Uh, and we will get back into this at well ten we'll to twelve minutes from now. So is tab options the equivalent of theme? Sort of, not really though. Uh, unfortunately, GT doesn't really have like a theme function yet, uh, but we do have something that's a little bit closer. It's called the opt function, so OPT underscore, which allow you to do some basic theming, but they're not like sort of like radically changing your table type themes. Uh, we don't really have that yet. It's kind of in the works, um, but we have some small sort of like theme -y like things in the opt functions. And what the opt functions do is they, 
they do a bunch of like calls to tab options on your behalf, but things that make sense for a certain task. And we'll see that near the end of this workshop, some useful opt functions. Any more questions? Oh, yeah, great. Uh, is tab options the equivalent of theme? Oh, I see. Okay, great. That was the same question. <laughs> Are the GT functions compatible with Shiny? Sort of. Uh, I mean, there's there's Shiny functions like the output and render uh, GT functions. So they are compatible. You just got to be a little bit careful that you don't make a, a giant table. It doesn't have things that, say, DT does, like pagination and controls. Oh, um, a helper function. Um, I, I, I view that as a function that's used within a certain scope. Like, for instance, MD is only usable in, um, you know, in, you know, like tab stub head or tab spanner when you're specifying a label. But anywhere else, it makes no sense. It just, you know, it adds a class to it. It just says, oh, yeah, this is marked down. Please process it as you know, mark down, you know, transform it. Uh, but any other time you serve MD by itself, it means nothing, like nothing's done. It only makes sense in, the, in a certain context. That's, that's what I mean by helper function. And really you can view, I guess, um, all of these, I guess, as helper functions in a way. Because um, what they do is they create a, a little bit of output that's needed just for that certain thing. Like, like this specifies a location. But if you were to run, run this anywhere else, it'd be basically nothing. It'd be, it would result in any output that's useful. Okay, I know I said I wouldn't talk, but does anybody uh, have any uh, sort of like clarifying? Like, does anybody want me to, to go over anything that was a bit confusing, like in extra detail? If I could do that, um, it could be any aspect that was covered in the last two. Most likely will be this RMD file, but um, we do have five minutes or seven minutes or so. so. Ah, okay. So if someone, if you're using Broom, have you heard of the, the GT summary package? There's also another package called model summary, which is also quite good. Um, 
it's more of a high level uh, package that uses GT and it allows you to take all sorts of outputs and just make a table from them and do it really flexibly. And then you're left with the GT table so you can even do more styling. Yeah, definitely check it out. So there's, there's two of them. Uh, they were both made at the same time by two different groups. Uh, so model summary, all one word, and GT summary, again, all one word, and they're both really great. Yeah, everybody is using Stargazer for this very thing, but I think people that did move to either one of those were very satisfied. Uh, they weren't missing much. And the great thing about those packages is they work with FlexTable. So at least GT summary, you can say, you can take your output from GT summary and say, as FlexTable. And then, um, yeah, there's a GT summary fan. Uh, <laughs> and you can just go from there and you know, put it in Word. So you can, you can do great stuff with that. So I'm just going to unmute myself and ask a question because I'm such a slow typer. Um, yeah. Any advice on how, so one of the reasons I asked about whether or not tab options were the same as a theme was like, how do you, if you apply certain things to all of your tables, is there a neat way of doing it just once? Yeah, you, you can basically make your own custom function, like your okay. own, essentially. Uh, and what you would do is you just, well, it's not easy. Uh, well, it's kind of easy. It's hard to describe though. <laughs> you would have um, like the call that you would have, you would make you know, my styling function and have the argument data. And then inside the function, you have data being piped to all the different tab options that you want. And you can even have like, you know, like um, arguments that you know, set some of the options uh, in that, in, in that uh, theme function that you make. Um, so that'd be one way to do it. So you, you may do things like you know, change the title, change all the font sizes, change the padding, all in one sort of one function. Um, any packages? Unfortunately, no, there's no, um, there's no extensions that besides, you know, like those GT summary model summary packages that use GT. Um, but there's no, <clears throat> it's not like a ggplot where it has a, you know, a huge amount of packages that have a bunch of themes. Uh, although that may, happen soon, maybe. <laughs> we don't really have that yet. Uh, so if anybody wants to do that, they're, they're free and it'd be very much welcomed if you were to, to do that sort of thing. Uh, when we get to module six, we'll see some of that theme stuff, but it's not a complete you know, change of the table. It's you know basically incremental sort of like you know some options are changed. You can add this other opt function and it does another cool thing. And uh, with a few of those, you may get to a, a table you want. Uh, but you may have to modify it a bit with tab options if you just need to just write. Okay, well, if there's no more questions and everything's you know, going well, I can move on to the next uh, two, two modules for this hour. Uh, so it's basically three and four, format data and modify columns. And uh, let me start right now with formatting data. This is actually quite interesting because um, if you ever try to format data in R, it's actually kind of tough. It's not fun or easy. Um, like just printing a number to get the right number of decimal places or, you know, the rounding just right. Sometimes you have situations where, you know, your trailing zeros are being dropped and you don't want them to be dropped or there's all sorts of things. And you get into things like, you know, significant digits, that's just totally a mess in, in R. It's hard to do. Um, but I'm, what I'm hoping is that these format functions, they take care of a lot of that. Uh, they make it so that you can be really precise and uh, you can really flexibly format your numbers or your dates and times and things like that. 
Um, and if that does not work for you at all, we have this other function, which is not covered here, but it's called text transform. So I'll just explain what it does. Um, after all the formatting is done, you may you know, format a number, but you may want to you know, change the text. Uh, so you can use text transform. What it does is it, it takes the text and uh, you can just apply a function to it. So you can do things like you know, paste, paste things to the text, uh, you know, add some HTML, do all sorts of wild things. Uh, so that's text transform. And uh, there's also something I'm not describing here as well. It's called just format not format number or scientific, just, just format. It allows you to specify your own uh, function again. Similar to text transform, except this operates across entire columns. And um, you, the, the great benefit is that you can you know, have a formatter function and then apply a, a secondary trans, text transform after that. So this happens first, this happens second on the formatted data. So, um, Lots of formatters um, for things like, I don't think, even think there's enough of these, but uh, you know, could definitely add more. But these are the, sort of the main ones I wanted at the beginning. Uh, format number, uh, formatting to get scientific notation, percentages, currency values, dates and times, uh, formatting you know, as markdown. So, so you have uh, column values, which are already in markdown. You can just use format markdown and it applies the transformation to to whatever the output format is. A really important one is format missing. You have NAs, they don't look really great in tables at all, uh, but you can change what it looks like with the format missing. Data color is kind of like, um, like a heat map for your table. You can specify, uh, we can map colors to, to values, either text values or numeric values. And um, we looked at one of these, these info functions. There's a lot of them here. Uh, info, you know, date style, time style. What these do is they give you some information on what styles are available. Let's look at info date style. Because uh, the styles are sort of numbered for convenience. Uh, but, you know, this is a sort of a, a great way to find out what these, you know, these numbered styles for, for dates. Uh, we'll do like, so you have this date here. It'll look like this if you apply style four. So that sort of thing. Okay, so let's move down uh, here and let's look at format number first. So it has lots of options because well, you really need them for formatting numbers. You know, you wanna have things like controlling number of decimal places. Um, so you want to have significant digits. You can just put a number here and you get that many significant digits. Uh, you may or may not want to drop trailing zeros or even the trailing decimal mark if you have it. Uh, you can use um, number separators. Those are frequently commas, but they could be uh, periods in certain locales. And speaking of locales, there's an option here where you can supply a locale. I don't know if you know about those, but if you do, it's quite nice. Um, it means it'll basically take control of some of these values, these options here, and just do the right thing for the locale. So let's look at info locales, just to see what that's all about. And uh, it's kind of a huge table because it's you know, upwards of 800 locales. But when it does appear, it'll show us um, how numbers will be formatted according to different locales. So this is locale code. This is what you would put inside locale. And uh, this is how the number would appear. And basically the, the only difference just in numbers is the, you know, the, the number separator and the decimal separator. And uh, it's not too much variation, but sometimes you get thin space. Sometimes you get these reversed. Uh, sometimes you get something even a little bit crazier, but it's not that often. Uh, it's kind of like some variation of this. So that's, uh, that's the locale uh, option means and what it does. Okay, so let's, uh, let's use example and make a simple table. It's got one column, but that's great because we just want to format these numbers. Right now it's in this sort of machine scientific notation or exponential notation. Not that great, but if you just use format number with its default options, uh, we get something quite different. We get this, we have two decimal places. It's uh, very dependable. 
uh, it just looks like that because the default is decimals equals two. Okay, so that's just a single application of a format number. Uh, but you may want three decimal places. That's a fixed number of decimal places being three. And uh, you may not want to use separators. So in this case, see for the very big numbers, we don't have these, uh, these number separators, which are every third number. So you may want that option uh, for certain contexts. So you can definitely do that there. So it's pretty fine control over formatting of numbers. And there's way more. Um, we can, there's a rows argument, so we can specify just certain rows. Here we're using, you know, one rows one to three, but we can also put in uh, an expression like, you know, num greater than some value or less than some value. So let's try that. So just in rows one to three, we have, you know, four decimal places. Otherwise we have, um, well, this is just a standard formatting. So basically these are not being formatted, but these three are. Great. Uh, so here's a case where Rose does take an expression like I alluded to before. Uh, and for just those values where another column, currency is greater than 30, not the num column, but currency, um, we can have four decimal places. So let's look at this. So we have num and currency. Currency value is greater than 30, four decimals over here. Um, these ones are below, these ones are definitely above. So they get, these ones here get four decimal places. So that's pretty cool. So you can use uh, sort of like this formatting based on other data and other columns. Okay. So here's another thing you can do. Uh, you can scale numbers. Uh, so just basically a multiplier, you can, you know, multiply this by one over 1000. And we can apply a pattern. So this is kind of like the value you get out. And this is the text you're going to append or apply. This could be beforehand, it could be after. You have multiple instances of x here if you want. Uh, but basically, this is the value coming out, and this is the text you're going to glom onto it. So let's take a look at this. So in this case, for the numbers that are greater than 500, which are the larger ones here, we've scaled it down to a thousandth of its original value and appended a k. Okay. And uh, the filter applied before the scaling. The filter being this. Yeah, it is. Uh, essentially, this captures the rows you're going to work on, or the cells you're going to work on. And then the scaling is, is happening just to those focused cells. Uh, I hope that, do I need to adjust my filter if I scale things? Can you uh, tell me what you mean by filter? Do you, do you mean this, like the rows? I guess that, that has yes, to be Yes, right. I just meant if right. you're scaling it by dividing by 1,000, but you're also yeah. applying a filter to that same thing, yeah, do you want exactly. to scale the filter by 1,000 or not? Oh, I see what you mean. Um, yeah, so basically this is just like capturing the, the, the cells you want. Okay. And all the stuff will only be applied to those, those rows. Okay. Yeah. That makes uh, sense, thank you. Yeah, no problem. And we can do a, a, a cool thing here. Um, so this is a bit of work I'm not gonna describe. Essentially, we're taking the country pops data set, which is populations in certain countries, well, all countries. And, uh, you know, we're doing something, you know, untidy. <laughs> We're, uh, we're getting years and for certain countries, we're uh, getting the population counts, population figures. So these are big numbers, not very convenient to have in this form, but we can use this suffixing equals true. What it does, at least for you know, English and other languages that use this informal sort of uh, notation, it'll automatically scale and apply suffixes for you. Um, this mainly works if you have you know, millions and billions, and I think it goes up to T. Um, so it works quite well there, but it's basically using this informal sort of like shorthand notation to sort of bring these values down. So it's a little bit easier to read. Uh, so that, that just involves this being true. 
Yeah, okay, great. Uh, so that's that. And we have more. So let's look at locale just for fun. Uh, in this case, we're, we're choosing uh, the French locale. Um, let's take a look at how numbers are formatted there. And these are just other variations of the locale or other locales I can use. So you can see right here that um, in this one, uh, we have thin spaces for the, for the group separators. And for the you know, decimal separators, we have uh, commas. Um, so that's the same as, this. so it's gonna be different than this. Oh, it's actually the same. Okay, uh, but it's certainly gonna be different than, than Germany. Yeah, where we have the dot there and uh, Austria, where it has like the, the space again. So that's uh, that's the locale. So basically, it takes care of things for you in terms of number formatting. Uh, it also works across different formatters, not just format number, but also format currency. Um, and it's sort of you know numeric. Uh, so format scientific. So sometimes you want values in scientific notation, but you want it to be correct. Uh, so that's what this does. Um, it's best to see in action. So we have. Exhibit, we're piping that to GT. We're gonna take one of these columns, number, and for certain values, you know, because we're doing this, this row expression, we're gonna have them in, you know, it's just a number. Uh, but for the other ones, we're gonna have them in scientific notation. So let's have a look at this. So here we go. Uh, yeah, some of them are in the, just format number, format, some are format scientific. Um, this is also in scientific notation as well. Uh, let me not look at it. So what this function does, it doesn't, it never does 10 to the, you know, 10 not, like 10 to the power of zero. Uh, it decides to not put it like that at all. Uh, 10 to the one, certainly, uh, 10 to the two, of course, but not 10 to the zero. So that's what this does. These are all in scientific notation. And it'll appear a little bit differently in different output formats, like LaTeX and Word, mostly the same, uh, but that's basically it. Yeah, that's all I have for scientific notation or format scientific. It's pretty good. It has a lot of the same sort of uh, arguments as for a number does, um, but displays differently, obviously. Uh, format percent. This is a nice one. So you want to format values as a percentage. And uh, a recent change in this is you may have values which are already scaled to percentages. Like, you know, you have a value called 50. That's already 50%. You just want to apply the percent sign. Uh, but the default case is that you have, you know, fractional values or, you know, that things that are, you know, fractions and they have to be scaled already. So let's have a look at that. Uh, let's take pizza place. We'll do a bunch of things to it beforehand to make a, a table. That's like this. Okay, so we have this uh, quota, fraction of quota. We want to change that to two percentages. So we'll do that with format percent. So, and we'll have one decimal place after the percent sign. And uh, there you are, they're as percentages. Uh, and you know, we can apply a locale to this if you really want to. It has a lot of the same sort of options as format number. Uh, the key difference being that just this automatically scales and applies the symbol to the, uh, to the text. Uh, here's a great one, format currency. This is quite a bit different because currency values are, you know, like numbers, but not really, they have lots of rules. Um, and it tries to do things for you. Like it understands which currencies are available um, and it'll format things with the right number of, you know, decimal places. Uh, most monetary values have two decimal places. Some have three. So it understands that. So let's have an example here uh, and we'll change the currency value here. So in Exhibit, we have a currency column. It has a bunch of values that uh, could be used for that and we do use it. So we have this, we can also have this. I can just type a D, <laughs> there we go. And um, what else is there? It's also this. So it understands currencies, it knows what to do. Um, and if you want to see what currency is available, it uses like a three letter currency code. So if you just go into the console, you can go info currencies and we can see which ones that 
uh, GT knows and understands. So we can now use the currency code recommended or the currency number, uh, but this one's a lot easier. And this will show an example of how it's actually formatted. And the exponent just means like number of decimal places afterwards. See, they're quite different depending on what they are. Yeah, so that's currency. Does GT work with the scales package? Um, it does in some respects. Um, like when we do things like specify um, scales for, um, for color values and data color, we're expecting you to use functions from the scales package. We recommend certain ones. And, but scales is huge and it has lots of uses. There's like tons of functions. It's mostly for ggplot, but there's lots of functions in scales which can be used to, you know, by themselves to scale values. And of course the output of that could be used anywhere you need to supply some values inside GT. Um, let's see. So here we have two currencies in two different columns. Let's just try this. Yeah, so nothing, nothing shocking. We're just applying a different currency on two different columns. And any values it won't actually apply anything to, which is kind of nice. It understands NAs. Great. Okay, bring this down a little bit. Okay, dates. So we can have dates and we can format them. Um, if you have a column that has dates, is this could be values <clears throat> that are of the date class, or they can even be character-based dates as long as they're in ISO eight six zero one date format, like like this. So I understand that. So we can do that sort of in the same way as all these other format functions. Specify the columns, in this case, bars date, because that's in Exhibit, and the date style, which is that thing I showed you before. So info date styles, or I think it was, yeah, info date styles. I won't show it again, but it'll show us a preview of all the different date styles. Let me just try them here, though, because it's really simple to do. Here we have date four, there's three. We go back to one and back to ISO notation. Let's run it again. And uh, does it go to six? It might. Further on you go, like there's more parts of the dates being excluded, I think is how it goes. Yeah, so you regain much less with that. So that's, uh, that's how you format dates. It's pretty nice if you know the format you want and it, you know, you have dates in your table. It does a pretty good job. Um, so let's try that with uh, format date. And we can do things like use conditional expressions like as date, date, greater than some date. We have to use this to make the comparison work, but it does work. And we're using two different date styles here. Yeah, see the, the month and the day are flipped in different cases where the you know, the conditional expression is true for some of them. So that's, uh, that's format date. It uses styles, kind of like ggplot, where it have, you have different sort of like data marker styles. Format time. So I know there's a time class that's not really part of BSR. So what this does is it understands data, string data, which is uh, in this format, hours, minutes, seconds. And then you can use uh, format time and then it has a time style. So let's take a look at that. And uh, you can set different time styles here. This is a 24 hour time. We have things with AM, PM as you go further on. This is stripping away the minutes. Um, yeah, and one is gonna be with the seconds, 24 hour time. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's format time. And finally, um, I'm not gonna show this example, but in interest of time, I'm gonna move on to date time. All it does is wrap together the date style and the time style, as long as you have you know, a, a POSIX CT um, column or some string in this exact format, this should work. 
So we get that. So we can modify both the date and time style and they're just, they're just put together. So that's how that works. I'll just make one more change here so you can see it. See, it's only the time that changed, but the, the dates were the same as before. Okay. Um, so here's one more form here, uh, format markdown. Allows you to take any text that's already marked down format um, and then you know render it nicely. So you can imagine we have a bunch of strings here, text 1a, text 1b, it's all in markdown. And uh, you know, we arrange it into a into it into a tibble with the triple function, all these different strings. Uh, let's see how it looks. Oh yeah, first we have to assign these. We'll do that. Yep. There we go. It doesn't look that great here in the table, but in GT it looks, you know, like markdown text. Uh, but when we use the front markdown function, uh, columns equals true just means all columns. We can use everything here, but true just means everything, you know, all columns. Let me get this. So it's been, uh, it's been you know, uh, transformed to HTML because that's the output format here. And the nice thing we can do is we can modify the width as well. There we go. So we have a, a text heavy table and that may be, you know, for qualitative data, you may have quite a bit of text. This is not a bad way to sort of like make it look a bit nicer. Okay, here's a great function. Um, Cause we, you know, we may have missing data and NAs don't look that great in a output table. So the function format missing is used to address that. Um, so let's take a look at this table right here. I mean, Exibil has NAs, I think in each column, or almost each column has NAs, at least one. And in this case, um, you know, we're gonna replace, you know, the missing values in columns one and two with the text missing. So let's try just that. And we can see it's missing right there. Kind of cool. And we can do the same thing with four and seven, replace that with nothing. Like so. And uh, if you were just to do this, oh, you have to specify columns. You, do, you might just do columns, everything. Uh, do I have an example there? No, we don't. So let me try it with everything. And we won't even like put in like, you know, like what the label is, we'll use a default. So the default is like a, a long dash and M dash, which is not that bad. And the cool thing is um, if you use format, sorry, not format, but tab footnote, you can apply a footnote to these and explain why certain values are missing. It'll just sort of like, you know, a light to this area over here of each of these dashes. And uh, that's good in a lot of cases to explain your missing values. So data color. Oh, any, uh, any more questions? Now we're past the formatters, like these FMT functions. Okay, well, if you have any, yeah, let me know, because uh, yeah, there's a lot there. Um, and there'll be a lot here in data color too. <laughs> so this allows you to, uh, to color your data cells uh, according to some value. And, and this is where scales comes into play. Uh, so we recommend inside data color to use a scales function. And it's a bit complex because, um, you know, these scales functions have their own arguments and data color has arguments as well. It's a little bit confusing. Um, but the good thing is in the help for for data color, just you know, accessible with question mark data color. There's a few examples to get you going, uh, so you can definitely jump off from that. And you know, otherwise it's very hard to remember, like things like domain, palette, things like that. Uh, but anyways, in this case, we have this table. So we have a country, year, population, and we want to color these population values. And we're doing that with call numeric. In its scale package. And what we're doing, we're just specifying a, a lower part of the domain and an upper part. So this would be, uh, you know, 2 million. <laughs> I don't know why I put it in that, in that way, but uh, 2 million to 4 million. And uh, let's see how it looks. So basically, it's going to go from red to blue. And these are sort of like the, sort of like the transition points for the, for the gradient. So let's have a look at that. So we can see we don't really have red because we're well above, you know, like red would be right here at, you know, 2 million. Uh, but we're getting to the orange and then transitioning to the green. 
the blue is pretty far away. You know, we end up at values of around 3 million, but blue is actually at 4 million. But that's how it's set up. We have these sort of like gradient points along the domain. And uh, the colors will just move through that. And they're scaled based on, uh, on numeric values. So other functions we can, we can use are call factor, call bin, uh, things like that. And they'll have a different you know, coloring uh, because they, they treat the values differently. So that's that. Um, you can do fancier things with the palette. You can actually take a palette from this pretty, I guess it's a popular package, Palleteer. And uh, let me just show you what that even does right here. Oops, steal the console for a second. So this will give us some colors inside this Palleteer package. It's based on a, another package, which is how you specify here, ggsci. And then here's the palette. And you have to use as character. If you don't, what you get is a print method, which is useful, but it's not useful inside here. You really just want these. So you have to ask character at the end to actually get these, uh, these HTML color codes that you need for the, uh, for the palette. Uh, so this is kind of the same thing. We're using calls numeric again. This time we're doing it across two different columns. Let's take a look and see that. And this is a uh, yeah, red material. So it starts from like a, a deep red to presumably less red. Uh, so we get here. So that's, uh, that's how you use Palleteer. Very useful, it has like tons and tons of colors in it. Um, there's actually a function inside GT, GT called info Palleteer. Uh, we could just go by package or just show them all. But in the interest of time, I just want to show one of them. And uh, these are just the colors in the color palettes. And this is just for one package of color palettes inside Palleteer. There's actually lots of different packages. So yeah, lots of colors to choose from. <laughs> you won't have any problems like finding color palettes if you use Palleteer. Uh, in this case, the domain is null. What it means there is we're using the data extents to determine the domain. Uh, so they're basically just like those form the domain. Okay, any, uh, any questions about uh, data color before I move on? Because uh, this is actually the end of this particular RMD file. In essence, format to format values, like these formatter functions. Data color, if you want to have like a heat map or some coloring of data based on. Ooh, okay, bye Lynn, <laughs> see you later. Yeah. Um, Absolutely, this is gonna be developed even more. Like there's some limitations to data color, obviously. We can't work across just certain rows. So that's, a, that's one limitation. But if you're fine with just operating across entire columns, like it's happening here, it's not a bad function to use. It's certainly better than uh, doing it as a GT and you know, getting all the different you know, color, um, color codes into each individual cell. When do you think colors in a table is a good idea? That's a very good question. Um, you may have certain things like, um, well, numbers, you have a huge table and it just might be better to have, you know, colors to show the structure of how the table is. It seems a very regular table where you have, it's almost like, a, it's almost, it has a regular axis, like, like, a, like a, a, a graph would, like a, a plot. Um, you know, like this pretty much has that right there. We have, you know, regular intervals of one year at a time. Imagine we have, a, you know, a matrix, we have, you know, different populations and we want to quickly show a structure. This might be good for things like weather, you know, temperatures, especially when color has some sort of like, you know, extra meaning and it's you know, meaningful on the data, then it works even better. Uh, populations, not so much, but, you know, temperatures, it works great. Um, you know, other things too, like, you know, altitudes, certain measurables that uh, can be related to a color, it works quite nicely, especially if you have tons of information. Um, if you have a very small table, yeah, it's probably not so great. And just, that's just my, my opinion though. I, I mean, there could be other use cases I haven't thought of yet. Welcome. Um, and I think we'll move on right in the middle of the hour, which is 
timing this so well because um, we're on to the, to the next RMD file, which is about modifying columns. And um, this one's much, quite a bit more easy to understand. Essentially, we're doing things to, um, to columns, either rearranging them, changing the alignments of the cells within the columns, or we're doing things like merging columns together and doing an interesting thing with the text uh, across the columns. So let's look at the easiest, least contentious thing, which is aligning values. Uh, by default, what GT will do is it will align values based on the value type, which makes a lot of sense. Um, so numeric values are typically aligned to the right. Uh, things like text is left. In the center, we'll have things like logical values, true or false, or you know more complicated things like list columns. Should you have that in there, just sort of like I'll put in the center. Um, so that's, that's, that's that, uh, but maybe we're not satisfied with that. We want to change it. Um, so we can do that. We can just use calls align and then set the alignment for certain columns. Uh, columns equals true means all columns. Um, it's set that way just so this doesn't you know, give you an error right away. Um, so let's try that. We'll use country pops here, make a table. And uh, the alignment, yeah, we have left for country name. Uh, population is to the right. I mean, it's a little hard to see. We can do like tab options and table width. And we'll do that to, let's say 500 pixels. I'm doing this so we can actually see the effect, the alignment. Oh, sorry. So, okay. So now we have extra space. We actually see the change in alignment when we actually do apply it. So in this case, we're going to take the population and align that to the left. So let's try that. So now we can sort of see it's clearly to the left. So we did that with calls align. We can, we can modify the alignment any way we want. One limitation is we don't have a rows argument, so we can't align individual cells to the left or right separately from the rest. It's kind of all or nothing. And uh, we can't do it independently of the uh, column label. That everything sort of goes to one side or to the middle or to the right. So that's a, that's a limitation. We can solve these, though, with tab style. It does allow you to target certain things. And there's actually an alignment um, argument there. So you, you could do that uh, with tab style, though. Uh, but this is kind of like just a simple way to align everything to a certain direction. OK, calls label. Um, reason for this is that the incoming data may not be the, at least the column labels, may not be the labels that you want in the final uh, table. So it's a bit complicated. Why, why call it calls label? Um, the reason for this, and it's a little bit confusing, um, even to me sometimes, when you reference any columns, you're going by the original column name of the data that you passed in. So this right here, these, these values, these are essentially the IDs, like the things that you want to use in bars or in um, any of the location helper functions. You want to stick to this, even when you change the label. You're actually not changing a label. You're, just, you're, just, you're actually applying a label to this ID. And by default, this becomes the label if you don't do this. But here, you're changing the label to make it a bit more nicer to read in the final table. So, you know, we have things like capitalization. It can be anything you want. And of course, well, not of course, uh, but we can do markdown again. I just want to demonstrate all the places this can be used just so we don't you know, lose track of that. So that we do that. So because this is just a label, we're never going to reference this column by you know, two asterisks and then name and then two more asterisks. We're always going to refer to it by its original name, uh, which is, um, I guess, the, the lowercase um, name value. So that's what you can do with calls label. You're taking the, uh, oh, sorry, what's country name? You're taking the, uh, the actual like ID or column name 
and you're changing the label for display. Okay, so I'm just demonstrating the same sort of thing, uh, just showing that it could be done with Markdown. And just so we don't forget, we use HTML as well. If you're into that, even sort of old school HTML tags will work, I think. Here we go. So this is like the older way of specifying italics. I think now it's uh, EM. Great, yeah, so you do either of these things or not at all. Uh, but yeah, so the column name goes first. Essentially, it's a list of arguments and it's got the label on the right and the column names on the left. And this is great because a lot of times you have underscores, they look great in data, they're easy to use, but they don't look so great you know, in the final table. Um, okay, so sometimes you have tables which are too narrow or maybe too wide if you use you know, tab options and column width 100%. And you want some fine control over the widths of the columns. You can do that with calls width, okay. So this one's a bit more complicated to, to, to describe, so I have to show it to you. In this case, where we have a two-sided R expression, um, either with column names on the left or select helpers, and then the actual size on the right-hand side. And this could be pixels, it can also be percent. And we have a lot of combinations and lots of outcomes possible if we mix together pixels and percents. And when we combine things like, you know, like the, the table width, which is in tab options, you have even more possibilities, which could be a little bit overwhelming, but uh, it gives you at least lots of control. And one thing I do wanna note is if you use pixels for each one of these, if you specify all columns with pixels, you'll get the exact width in pixels, no matter what. So what true means here is like the rest of the columns. So it could be the same as everything in columns. So let me try this. So we have this table right here. Let me show you how it looks just when you get into, you know, into GT without changing the widths. And now we'll show it to you with columns width applied. Okay, much wider now. And the key thing I wanna show you is, this may seem, you know, unusual or strange. This will actually clip the first column because it's so narrow, but at least it's possible. Like otherwise you wouldn't be able to do this if all these PX values weren't specified. It would do something like make up the rest with some relative sizes. It would just sort of like make up the rest of the uh, you know, size or it fit to width. But in this way you can have very fine control over the widths, even with clipping. It may be desirable in some cases where you just have a color in there, you don't have text. You may wanna have it a certain you know, narrow uh, width. Uh, but at least it's possible. So that's what you can do there. Oh, sorry, everything's gotta be typed in. So we're back to where we started there. So just to prove that you can use percentages, let's try that, PCT. And we don't have to make these add up to 100%. It'll do some normalization for you. Like certainly this will go way above 100% because we have multiple columns. it'll just relatively size it for you. It'll sort of normalize to 100%. Yeah, and um, one more interaction, the thing I described, tab options. You can have that to say pixels 500 and see it'll, it'll size it. It'll still keep the relative widths, even though it's the overall width is changing. Okay, so that's if you really want it to look a certain way. Uh, so you have that part of the shiny app, you want it to be sized just right, you want to have some predictability, uh, you can definitely do it with calls with. And the up and down sizes you can set in tab options with things like uh, row padding. And there's even more finer options if you want it later on. I'll talk to you about that later. Okay, so that's a, there's a lot to unpack there, but I hope that sort of gives you an indication of what you can do. Uh, calls move is a bit easier. And this was made way before dplyr had those relocate 
uh, functions. I think it's just one function. Um, but this was made sort of before that. And it's still useful. So if you're in GT, you don't have to relocate here. You can just do it inside GT. So let's take a look at the before table. Uh, we have country name, year, population. Uh, but we want population to be after country name, just right after. So let's run that. Yeah, so that moved it. So basically the columns to move and where you want to move them. That's how that works with the calls move. Great. Um, let's see here. Let's go to calls hide next. So um, yeah, you, have, you, you got a column in your table. You don't want to show it. You can do a calls hide. Just uh, say which columns you, you want to hide and they won't be there in the end. Uh, which is kind of cool because sometimes you want to use a function. I start not a function. You want to use a column for the data it has in the GT API, say in one of those conditional expressions uh, where you're specifying rows and using some data from a column that's you know to the left or to the right. But you don't want to show that column in the end where you're getting the data from. You just it's essentially a work column. Um, you can hide that with calls tied and. It makes the workflow a bit nicer. So let me show you this. So we have country name, some country codes, year population. I don't really want these in the table, in the file table. So I'll just use calls hide, specify those columns, and they don't appear anymore. Now, an important thing to note here, this is sort of a good detail, but it's kind of important to know, is if you have footnotes, like say here or here, and you hide those columns, those footnotes will be gone. They'll be, they'll be, you know, any remaining footnotes will be renumbered, reordered. Uh, the effect will, it'll resolve itself in terms of footnotes. That's a really important thing because footnotes are, you know, of course, have a very strict ordering. There's rules. If you just hide a column, you, you don't want to see like, you know, missing footnotes, you know, that would be a mess. So basically it's really, calculated. So hiding things is great if you just want to, basically there's no downside to hiding things if you need to. You don't have to reconsider other aspects of the table. You can just hide things and be confident that uh, GT will just handle any downstream effects. Okay, so that's calls hide. So here's an example of where you'd probably use it. Uh, and here's a footnote example as well. So we have this table right here. Great. Looks good. We want to put a footnote to um, population greater than you know three million, and this, it's a really silly note. The population is above three million, and we're hiding the population. Okay, uh, but we're actually putting the uh, footnote in the year column. Okay. Okay. So the footnotes be applied. It's using data from a column which is no longer there. It's hidden, um, but you know it's quite nice because we have to use data inside GT, uh, but not actually show the data that we used because it wasn't relevant to the you know to the final table. So that's one one good use case. Okay. Um, next thing I want to show you is merging columns together. Uh, the reason you would do that is sometimes values naturally go together. They're hard to express together. They have to be done separately. For lots of reasons, you may have separate formatting on two different columns and you want to bring it together with some sort of like, um, you know, some sort of text that sort of like, you know, you know packages it together into like one single entity. Uh, a common thing is like a range. You know, you have two values, you know, it's not a single column. It's easier to handle in two columns. You just put a dash between it. So you can do that with, this function calls merge range. You can specify the separator. And the great thing is like uh, you can do auto hide, which means that the second column just disappears. It's already, it's hidden. So which is good because you don't want to keep the two different values. You just want to have the, the merged set together showing in the table. So let me show you that. Uh, let me show you the table before. So these columns, we're putting these values together with merge range, calls merge range. 
Uh, the first column is MPGC, second is MPGH. And uh, so let's do that. And then we're going to relabel the original one so it's no longer MPG underscore C. It'll just be called capital MPG. And there you go. And that's uh, that's done with merge range. It's it's a common use case. That's why it's, it's a separate function. Uh, but we also have like a very general function called calls merge, where you specify your own pattern, which columns are involved, which ones you want to drop or hide. And uh, but this is just a simple use case because a lot of times you have a, a range and you do want to you do want to just make it easy. Uh, another one is calls merge uncert for uncertainty values. So you have one column that's a value, another column that's an uncertainty value, and you merge them together. Then we have a separator. This is kind of like symbolic of the real plus minus sign, which is the one character, but it's hard to express Unicode in you know, arguments, values. So we just do this and it just gets transformed. Um, but you can specify something else and it becomes a literal value. So let's have a look at this. Uh, same principle, we have a two columns. I'm going to merge them. So this is very silly because we're using a symbol, but this will be the value column. This will be the uncertainty, uh, which is pretend it works. And uh, let's use calls merge. And there we are. So we have some value plus minus the real symbol, and then you know the uncertainty value. Uh, the cool thing is, if you have any values, it won't show. It'll do a number of things. If you have an NA on the value, it'll just be NA. If you have an NA on uncertainty, it'll just show the value. If you have two NAs, it'll be NA. So it's got, there's some rules to handle NAs with this. You don't have to worry about them. It, it makes you know, a bit of sense. And the nice thing is if you don't want this NA there, you can just format, format missing to, to replace it. Uh, yeah, and then we have a general calls merge. A little more complicated, but it gives you a little more freedom to do what you want. Uh, in interest, interest of time, I do want to give you a break of 10 minutes. I'll just show you what this does, and I'll explain afterwards. So calls merge, working on low and high in that order. Low corresponds to one, high corresponds to this bracketed two. And this is like the, the glue around it. This is essentially the, the text that goes around it between the values, a dash or a hyphen. And that's how it works. And we're hiding the columns high. We no longer want that. And then later on in a separate call, we're relabeling open and we re relabeling low to be open close, low high, because they're together now. Okay, um, that is the end of this. There was a lot there. I was talking like a, like a mile a minute. Sorry about that, but um, hope you absorb some of this. Otherwise, um, ask questions. You can definitely um, feel free to use you know, the practice RMD, which has a, a few things you, you can use. Or you can just play with this as well, uh, if you have it open. Um, otherwise, I'm going to try to keep a mouth shut for about 10 minutes. Unless you ask questions, then I'll definitely answer those questions. Set variable labels. Um, I don't think that'll work with GT. I think it's quite specific to GT summary. It certainly hasn't been tested. Um, but I wonder if it does work accidentally, if it's more convenient than what it has. Because <clears throat> what GT summary is doing is it's basically using GT functions and doing a lot on top of that. It's got its own functions. So it may or may not work. You should. You should be the first to try it and let me know. <laughs> and, and the GT Summer team is moving pretty fast with their package. So they're adding lots of functions and doing great stuff. If, you, thanks. if you're following them on Twitter, they, they make announcements of what they're adding. It's always really great stuff. And um, I'm also really impressed with the number of models it handles. It's just a, a lot of small outputs. But like it has all the, the broom types, and I think I've even more on top of that, if I'm not mistaken.
Oh no. Can you tell me what set variable, variable labels does? That, that maybe gives it a, a better advantage over calls labels, aside from the easier to say name. <laughs> I can take a look too, but I don't wanna change my, my browser. Sorry, I just had to unmute myself. So yeah. the way you can use it in a deep IR pipe, so you could take your data set and then do set variable labels and then do all of your columns. Oh, of okay. Um, so you're doing it beforehand? Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so I had that um, I had the request before. I just learned of this being a thing. Like you can have column labels inside a deep IR object. And there's a, a few packages that do that. There's actually really interesting things you can do inside, you know, as attributes to a table or a data frame. And, uh, you know, things like units, you can put those inside, associate them in the columns before you even get to GT. But GT currently doesn't know about them, understand them. But I think that'd be incredibly, you know, great for GT because that's, it's all about taking the information, unpacking it and displaying it somewhere. So I think it'd be fantastic to have, say, the variables already, you know, being displayed where they would normally be displayed. And more importantly, other things like units, which I think would be incredible, especially if we can render them nicely if they're like, you know, LaTeX formulas or things like that. I'd be um, able to an issue if that's useful. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Because like, make me aware, I'll, I'll triage it. I'll basically prioritize it and put it in a, you know, in a milestone for a future release. Okay. I, I especially think the, 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 you know, the column labels thing is, I mean, it's not trivial, it's easy to understand. It's not gonna be hard to implement. So I think if you put that in a issue, it would be solved pretty soon, like implemented. Okay, that's cool. So I think it's just really handy to be able to do once at the top and then not have yeah. to worry about the fact that age is age brackets, years or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And you can do fancy things like add line breaks or markdown for the labels or... Um, I haven't tried. Um, Maybe possible. Hey. Yeah. Um, At any rate. I think they seem to disappear if you do things like reshape your data, even if those variables stay the same. Ah, uh, so you gotta do it at the end or something like that. Like, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure, but I feel like that's something that happens. So I can't deal with a lot of kind of transformations, but. Okay, I'm gonna have to look into that because like um, this one GitHub organization, I think it's called, oh, I forget what it's called. It's something to do with values, like R values. They're the people that I think are also doing packages like S SF. They got, <clears throat> they got a package called units. I think it's called units or something, something to that effect. So, you know, having both would be great. And I think it's what people ask for, the units part anyways. So I got a question here, what's the difference between coding in the console and the code editor? Um, well, the console, you could just type anything. And uh, as long as you have like the complete, you know, executable line, it'll just be returned in the console. And uh, also a side benefit is that if you have something that results in the GT table, it'll appear in the viewer. But if you're coding in, you know, the editor, in this case, it's an R markdown, you know, format, you know, we're using a special, the editor is a little bit different. It's not, it's not a script, it's basically an R markdown file. If you run your code inside these R code chunks, the output will always appear here. It'll never appear in the console and also any GD tables will appear below. Um, but if you're just using a script, which is just, you know, R script, it's just like the console, essentially just taking things that you run, it's putting in the console and, and just going through that sort of like that route. Um, 
but but generally for for this, it's less confusing for me to just like work in the R markdown for this, you know, for a workshop format and just go down and see the output and keep going. Oh, and I should say really quickly before I go on, you can knit this as well. And I do have the outputs being knitted. Uh, so I won't press this button right now. But if you just look at number four, you can see the output is knitted. Um, I guess my browser is what you want. Oh, you got dark mode. It doesn't look that great. But essentially, this is like the, the rendered output um, of that R markdown file. So we see the GT tables appear in the same way as they do in the, in the document itself, except this is a standalone HTML file. I'll wait another minute just to be at the top of the hour. Okay, uh, this next two set of modules, um, well, at least this one is only two functions. <laughs> so normally we've been going through like, you know, half dozen or a dozen functions. This only has two and they're very similar in lots of ways. Um, but it's also a little bit complex and it's very difficult to use just because it's hard to remember all the different parts that go inside um, each of these functions. And um, only because you're expressing something pretty complicated, you're expressing, you know, how you're going to aggregate values, you know, what columns are involved, you know, and other things like formatting those values. Luckily, we do have uh, some documentation to get you going. You go on the console and type in question mark, summary rows, for instance. Um, I do try in each of these help files. They're available here, of course, in help, but also in the GT website, which is accessible through the repo. You just go to the website and then there's a references section, which basically shows you this in a nicely formatted, you know, web page. Um, the help for, you know, each function. And I do try to give examples which are fully worked out and you can just, you know, go from. Uh, so the key thing being here, summary rows and what you do inside. And of course, try to explain it and picture so it you know matches up with um, you know what you might get in your computer. Um, otherwise, you know sometimes this text is a little bit dense, um, but the examples are they quickly get up and running with the examples. Okay, and um, so what we're doing here with summary rows is adding summary rows. And uh, you can do that in, in two ways. You can add summary rows across groups. So we make groups by um, you know, specifying which rows are parts of groups um, or belong to each group. And that's usually done with the GT function with the group call uh, argument. 
or you may have like um, summaries that work across all the data in the table. And that'd be what we call a grant summary. And you can have both. So you can have both group, uh, both summary rows and we can have also grant summary rows in the same table. So you're basically calling this, you know, once each time, like each of these functions in the same uh, sort of pipeline, GT function calls. Okay, so let's take a look at how we actually use summary rows. So we have these arguments right here. So it works across certain groups that you can specify. You can use it across certain columns and by default it works across all columns, which is maybe not what you want, especially if you have different data types and, and the aggregation may not work across you know, all data types. Then we have an argument here, FNS, that's functions. So we're gonna specify the functions to use to make those summaries. Missing text is for any values which are missing, that might be quite a few. Um, because we may, work, we, may, we may only work across a few columns, but the rules are still there. So we have to you know, fill in the space. So we, we can use like this triple dash, which just becomes an M dash or a long dash in the end. And this uh, formatter allows you to specify a formatter function to, you know, to format the values that you do get out of the summary. And this dot 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 allows you to give arguments to the formatter. It's a lot, but examples, they really help here. So let's make the, the basis table exhibible going into GT and we're creating the framework here. So we have a stub and we have row groups, group A and group B. So we're gonna do a summary uh, across both groups. Okay, so summary, we're gonna create rows right below row four and right below row eight, there'll be extra rows. And the names of the rows, like, there's a stub here. So this sum here, we're creating a sum, but this is actually gonna be the label. And uh, of course we can use the sum function for this case. The dot stands for the data. And the part that's confusing is this, we have an equal sign and a one-sided R formula. So we have to put the tilde there and then the sum. The reason we have to do this is because we don't want to, to run right inside. We want it to sort of be held as a formula and be evaluated later. So that's why we do that. Okay, let's show you the whole thing. Um, here goes nothing. Okay, so if we go down here, oh, kind of scroll nicely here. We can see that um, we're just working across the numbers column. That's always specified in columns. So the sum is here. And there's the there's the sum, you know, one of the summary rows. And here's the other one for group B, which is great. Any missing values, because we didn't consider these columns are just given this long dash. And uh, that is about it. Like it's key also to use this NARM equals true because we do have an NA there. And if we don't use it, we'll get like an NA here. Okay, so that's so what we just sort of like, you know, that's intentional right there. And, you know, we can change this to some like that and it'll change our label in both places like that. Great, so that's, that's how you use summary rows. And there's more to it than that. Um, like for instance, we can just get rid of, we just consider group A, let's try that. So we have a summary row there, group B does not. Okay, so we're just targeting the one group for the summary rows. I'll show you a more advanced example. Maybe, maybe you want to have different aggregation functions, um, you know, across, but still use the same row. I'll show you that. But that's coming up much later. Uh, first, I'll show you this. Uh, so we'll have more functions here. So in this case, we want sum, min, and max. The labels will be the same as the function names. It's just a coincidence, I guess. And in this case, we're just you know operating across the number column and all groups. Okay, let's see how this looks. And also in this case, we're specifying a formatter, format number, and it has the argument decimals one as a separate arg you know, separate line here. It's the same as right here. Okay, I know it's a lot, but this will be, be a big payoff here. Okay, so we have this. These values are formatted the same way as this because we, we made it so. And we have some min max and you know a ton of empty stuff here. 
Maybe you don't want these dashes, like these hyphens. You can always do, if I can just find the phone, missing text. Do this. If you want to look a bit cleaner, I'm running that now. And now we just have like a this space, which is actually kind of nice. I mean, we don't, it's pretty sparse. So, you know, having those, those dashes doesn't look too great. So that's how you do that. Okay, there's more, there's way more. Um, this is very complex. So I'll show you one bit at a time here. So we can add summary group summary labels for the currency column as well. So in this case, we're using format currency to, uh, to format the values and we're reusing the summary labels. Okay, that's a key thing right here. So we're doing this twice, summary rows right here, summary rows up here. There's a bit of formatting in between. It's just sort of snuck it in there. But the idea here is that because we're using, we're using these labels, it'll reuse those rows. It won't make a new row. It'll be the same row, but it'll be formatted differently. It'll be different values entirely. Okay, let's we'll just run this and see what the effect is. Okay, it's pretty nice because we ran summary rows twice across two different columns. And uh, we had to use it twice, unfortunately, because we had a different formatter in the end. So we had to do that, even though like the same aggregation functions would have worked just fine, they're just numeric values. But in this case, we had format currency that had to be used. This case was format number. Um, so that's why we did that twice. But at least it reuses rows intelligently, as long as you have the same label. That's the key thing. Uh, if you put something like, you know, total here, that won't be the same at all. It'll be split that way. Okay. Probably not what you want. Um, and so that's why you can reuse rows which are already been made. So these are the ways to do that. Okay. Um, so let's use SP500, create another table with row groups. So this one's, these functions are doing all sorts of things to, to SP500 to make it less of a huge table. Let me just show you what it looks like. So not a big table at all. Uh, week two, week three of a certain year. Um, and it's got a few values, okay. Great, uh, so because these are, you know, currency values, this will be just a review. We use format currency on everything. And by default, it uh, just does it like this. Uh, summary rows, this is kind of like where we want to go. Um, in this case, we're operating across open, high, low, and close. So these columns, we have these functions, min, max, average. In this case, we don't expect any NAs to be there. So we don't have to put any dot rm equals true. Uh, you know, it wouldn't hurt if you did, but we don't have to here. Uh, but the key thing here is we're specifying the format currency to make these new generated values the same as these values, at least appear the same. So there we go. Um, pretty nice. Does what we want to do? Does it across groups? And again, we could, you know, not have groups equals true, just apply to one group. But that's the option you have. Okay, so that's uh that's these are like call sort of group wise summaries, and we can do grand summaries as well. It's got a special function for that called grand summary rows, and the thing that's missing is the groups uh, argument because the the idea is that we're not considering groups at all. We're working across all the data, even if the data is grouped. We're still using all the data to create the uh, summary values. So that's why that is gone. Um. So yeah, this will apply to all rows and it'll appear at the bottom of the table each time. There's no option yet to put it at the top or it's so it's gonna appear at the bottom, but it's gonna be at least mar nicely marked off to appear differently with a, a double line. So let's see how it works. So we have this table right here. Um, we'll stop one short of going to grand summary rows to see the table. There we are. So this is grouped. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna call grand summary rows and it's not gonna worry about groups. So we're gonna call that whole thing and scroll down. So we don't have any summary rows here, nor do we have them here, but we do have this double line and we do have the grand summary here. So this min is the min of all values here. So it appears to be here, 
the max is not here in this group, but it's here because it's considering all the different values. And the average is across all the values. So that is grand summary rows. So it has a double line, which could be totally modified if you want it to be in tab options or tab style. Uh, you, can, you can change the look of that. Uh, there's another question between what's the difference between everything and A. Okay, so I'm presuming this for, yeah. So everything in just means we're choosing all columns. Yeah, and if you did bars, um, oh, did you mean to say true? Okay, it doesn't matter. Oh, dot, okay, great. You mean dot here? Hmm. Okay, well anyways, everything here, it means that we're choosing all of the columns. Yeah, if you want to choose just a few columns, it could be bars, open, or high. That just makes summaries for those two columns. We can also use true. It's the same as everything. I just wanted to mix it up a bit and show you all the different things, uh, all the different possibilities for doing pretty much the same thing. Um, let's see here, so that's the grand summary. And um, if you really wanted to, maybe you, we do have some time, lots of time here. We can take this, because it's really the same table. We can take summary rows right there. And we'll put that in here. And as long as I'm not missing something, this should absolutely work. Okay. <clears throat> so in this case, we have summary rows across the groups, all columns, all groups. So WO2 has those rows. WO3 has those summary rows. And the very bottom, there's more. There's these ones right here. So one thing you might want to do just to make it more distinguishable from like these group rows is to change the labels a bit. You can say, you know, I don't know, you may want to put in capitals, some way to mark it off to be a bit different. Um, but, but just know that double line means that you're entering into the grand summary uh, rows. Okay. Um, and like I said, it's not very easy to use because there's a lot to, lot to, there's a lot to it. So yeah, don't feel bad using question mark grants, you know, summary rows or question mark grant summary rows to, to get to the help. Any uh, specific questions about summary rows before we move on? Okay. Well, if there are, yeah, feel free to ask. Like, but for now, I'll just move on to the next one which is table option functions. And uh, this is kind of like finishing touches for your table in a way, or, or just setting options which are convenient in a simple sort of like wrapper function. It's almost like a macro where it does a few things for you, always reaching into tab options and setting the right options that you need. Um, some of these are simple, some of them are a little more complicated like this opt CSS, um, but they give you a lot of power no matter which ones they are and they're quite useful. So let me show you what they do. Um, opt footnote marks. I think we may have seen this before. We can change the marks that are used in footnotes. I'll get into it a bit more because there's even more options than what I showed you before. Um, so for instance, we have you know, this table over here. I'm gonna show you what you do right before the very last thing, which is opt footnote marks. There we go. We have this table, one and two. And looks pretty good. But for instance, we want to have, you know, different marks. We're going to call from the standard set of marks. So in this case, we get like a, a set of marks like an asterisk, uh, this this crook, this dagger, and there's more beyond that. And they repeat once they get to the end of the series. They, they just double up. Uh, that's standard. There's also, I believe, extended. We won't be able to see that because it just adds more to the end. So they're, for all intents and purposes right here, they're the same. Uh, but we also have things like we do, not numbers. Uh, is it numbers? Yeah, maybe it is. Yeah, numbers. We can do letters. 
this is a bit of a confusing thing. We can do letters, not in quotes. That's the vector of letters. And just for a bonus, capital letters. That gives us capital A and B. Um, because maybe you know this or maybe you don't. You can just go to letters in the console and it's just letters. And that is the series of marks. Yeah, or you can specify your own, <clears throat> like so. Um, it could be, just to be a little bit evil, we can do this. And have it backwards uh, and specify our own series. Uh, so that's what we can do there. You can specify your own, your own marks with a vector. Uh, you can use some of the keywords for different things. And that's what opt footnote marks does. Okay. Okay, opt row striping. So it's an option to add or remove row striping. Uh, so what's that? So basically just like every even row, there'll be like a stripe, like a row stripe. I'll show it to you. I'm, I'm sure you know what I mean though. It's, So it's kind of subtle because the color chosen is just a few steps away from, from white. Um, and that could be changed. But right now it's basically you're adding striping by just having this. There are some options. Um, well, so you have striping on <laughs> for a reason you want to turn off, you can use that false. So presumably later on, if we have themes and they automatically includes, include striping, we have a quick way to turn it off. But I think we haven't got to that point yet, but I guess you can say this function set for the future. So, so we have striping on or off. That's what this does. Uh, originally, this was part of the, the default look of GT, having some striping. Uh, but then I found out people didn't really like that, having striping. So I made that not the default. So now I have to turn it on. Great, uh, so the next opt function, this one's pretty useful because um, what it does is it'll align your table header to either to the right or left. And um, right now it's by default, it's center aligned, but it actually looks really nice if you put it to the left. So let me just show you a table. Uh, we'll do before and after as we often do. So here's the before, the default look of the title of the table and the subtitle. We use opt align table header and align to the left. We can do this. It's not too bad. I mean, um, if you really want to, you can do this as well. Okay. Let's see if this works. Uh, so we can do things like non breaking space. Maybe have two of them. There's better ways to do this, by the way, but this is just like a hack if you need it, if you want a little bit of space on the left. You can find some space. Unfortunately, it's not that great. It's better to have something called a, uh, like an actual padding because the, you know, the size of character of blank spaces is big, different. So we're gonna get a good alignment, but there's other ways of doing this in a much more nice manner. Uh, but you, you can at least see that it'll align left and you can do things. So that's pretty cool. So I'll show you to the right, just to prove that it works. There you go, tell a table and subtitle to the right. And you can't change the, you know, the title and subtitle to be different alignments. Uh, they're all or nothing in this case. But you can do that with tab style, for instance. Uh, you, just, you just target one of these elements and you can use the alignment and set that to left or right separately. Uh, okay, here's another one, opt all caps. So it's an option to use all caps in select table locations. Okay, so what's the reason for that? Um, there's no great reason. And sometimes some tables have that look where you, you capitalize you know, the labels and the data looks a bit different. Sometimes the, you know, the, the column names or the labels to the left will be a bit large and this shrinks the size of it. So it might look better, but this is all a matter of opinion. But let's see what you think of it. Uh, this is how it looks when it's applied. So at least it distinguishes all this sort of like surrounding uh, set of labels from the actual 
data itself. And if you don't have it, it'll look like this, as we've seen many times before. So it'll affect you know like everything in the stub, including these summary row labels. So I'll show you two one more time. It's running. There you are. Great. So that's uh, that's what summary. Sorry, that's what opt all caps. You have a few options. Um, so that's turning it off or on. But you also have locations. So we can just do it to the stub if you want. So just apply it there. So you can choose a number of different locations. And it's all in the, the help, which ones are valid values to use. Great. Uh, next one has to do with table lines. There's an option to set table lines to different you know, extents. So you can have one that's very maximal, have all the table lines which are possible in your table. You can have no table lines if you want to go minimal or just use the default set. Um, that's a good thing to use if you see so you start with something that has all lots of table lines and you just want to go back to the default set of lines. OK, there's a lot of description there, but really the, the key thing here is that we're using opt table lines, and we're just going to see the effect. So the default is to put all the table lines that, you, that are possible, including lots of vertical lines. This is not bad if you do want lots of lines, and you just want to omit some lines later on with different function calls. You can use you know, call borders, and uh, it removes some of them. But start from a place where you have lots of table lines. Uh, sometimes you need them. Uh, or you can do the opposite, um, extent, none. Let's run that. And we'll be free of table lines with this. And you can just add in the lines you want, or maybe not at all. This is not a bad idea if you just you just have like a grid of values and you, you know, maybe you want to do something different with it, like not have anything here, but maybe color the cells get rid of the values, you know, things like that, and, and have this more as a layout without lines. Uh, there's certain use cases where this is useful, although it's not incredibly obvious just by looking at this. Uh, opt table outline. So this is kind of like the, the, the last bit of it. Sometimes you may want an outline, uh, but not all the other lines that go with it. So this is very specific. And the other cool thing is that you could specify the type of line, like the style. This could be solid. It could be dotted or dashed or double. You can set the width of that with this and the color. So let's try that with this table. Same table we've been using in the previous examples. In this case, we're just using the defaults for opt table outline. It's a little hard to see because um, in the output, it's basically like cropped right to the line, but it, it's there. It's a little more obvious when you see the document. We can do things like change the color. Hoping now we can better see it. There we are. So we can change it that way. And there's the width. I'll just change that to pixels. Let's go. Let's go big. There we go. A very big outline. And the nice thing is, all the all the content serves just gets scrunched in. It doesn't overlap with any content that might be close to the edge. It basically takes into account the the border. Uh, opt table font. So we saw before that we could add a font to certain areas with tab style. Um, this makes it easy to add it to the entire table. And you can still use tab style to change certain locations, but this is kind of like a default font for the entire table instead of just using what's, uh, what's in, the, in the default set. So let's see how that works. Um, what you're doing is your new table is usually good. So I'll do it right here. That's, that's our starting table. Uh, and what we're doing here is we're using opt table font. And it has one argument, font. I think that's, that's it. And then you can actually supply a list, which is kind of interesting. What if you're offline and you don't have access to Google fonts? Then it won't have this font, but it'll use Cochin next or use Serif. So let's try that. Great. So it's actually using Meriwether. Uh, say you spelled it wrong in two hours to show you that it goes on to the next one, which is coaching there. 
But if we do spell it right, we do get it, and we're online. So we have the font. OK, so that's op table font. Uh, let's show an example of this using a data set we haven't used much of, this SZA1. Uh, let's show you what that looks like before applying a font. Okay, pretty small narrow table, just has solar zenith angles and the timestamp. And um, let's take a look at having these two right here. Sorry, I'll just run that. Okay, so what we've done here is we're using Helvetica Noia because it's on my system. So we can use fonts, which are not just Google fonts, but it could be your system fonts. Uh, but say this is not here, like that, that's not it. And this is not, you know, matching to a font you have in your system. It'll go to the default font set. Let me show you what that is. If you run a function, it's just a vector. And this is what's being used by GT by default. It uses like, if, if you have this font, it'll use that. If you don't have it, it'll go onto this one and so on and so forth until you get to like more general fonts or even, you know, like sort of like descriptions of font types. So that's what I'll do. It'll have fallbacks. So we can specify a bunch of fallbacks here in this list. And so it'll go back to the default look because it doesn't know these ones. So I'll set back. It's kind of subtle because the difference is not that large between these, but uh, that's what you're doing here with optable fonts. You can specify a list of fonts or a vector of fonts which could be system fonts, Google fonts, or a mix. And just to finish it off, I did opt all caps just to make these capitalized. Great, so that's, uh, that's opt table font. It's really good. Um, here's a complex one. If you're into HTML and CSS, obviously this one only works with HTML output because we're, we're having a way to inject or to change the CSS of the output table with op CSS. Now, it's a bit complicated if you don't know CSS. I'll, I'll give you a strategy or two to, to make sense of this because uh, there's a way and it's pretty good. So but first, let's take a look at our basis table, the table before we make the styling changes. This is the table we have beforehand before we make any changes. So it just has number of currency, some formatted values. Uh, looks pretty fine. Um, but we want to do something you know, that we can't do in the GT API. Let's say there's no style in the arguments list that supports a style we want to put in. Um, like say for padding, we want to have very specific top and bottom padding and specific left and right padding. We want to align you know, the call heading. We want to do it through, through here and not through the GT API. Because sometimes, sometimes you can't. Uh, so we use opt CSS. And a really important thing here is that we give, we haven't seen this yet, we give the table an ID. So that's in the GT function. Before ID was just a random value to keep the, you know, the IDs of each table separate from any other table on a markdown document. But here you want to set it because we actually have to use it inside our, you know, inside our, you know, our rule sets for CSS. So we just specify one as an example. You can think of any name. As long as you're repeating it down here with the pound sign, this is the ID for the table. And this is a certain class. And this will mean nothing to you until we actually look at the table. So how do we do this? Um, what I do is I right click here and I go to inspect element. And I hope this is not too small. Hope it appears. Okay, so we can actually use like different browsers will have similar tools, a way to sort of look at certain elements. And we see here we have you know all these things in dots like gt underscore call underscore heading uh, things like that those are classes so if we know the class we can target this area and we can apply a specific rule so that's what we're doing here and it can be things like um, like selectors like td we could just use td by itself and like apply style to all of tds but basically these are you know table values okay so let's get out of this. So if I discover the different uh, classes, they all begin with dot. So this means that in the table one, which is the table that we're on, we're going to target all GT rows. And we're going to change the padding. This one, we're going to um, just go to the class. This is the heading. 
and we're going to change the alignment to center. This important thing is sort of like an override or an importance, not importance, but uh, a specificity sort of uh, rule, which means that this must be done. If you have other rules that affect the alignment, this one will be more higher priority, like highest priority. Okay, we'll just run this so we can see the result. So the background color is blue, sky blue for the GT table. And uh, the rows have lots of padding. 20 PX we see it's you know, really big. And 30 on the left and right sides. So it's really more padding on the left and right than top and bottom. Uh, this is like shorthand, so it's a little confusing. There's typically four values. It could be one value or two values as well that they apply to certain sides of padding. And here's the cool thing. Uh, this currency value, of a, well, both currency and num, they're now centered. And they're different than like the, the column values, like the actual like, like data cell values, which are right aligned. So we were able to change the alignment of just the headings with this. And you can do lots more interesting stuff. If you play with CSS and you know, look at it and discover lots of things, you can radically modify the look of the table with that. And uh, yeah, so that's opt CSS, sort of advanced function that it's good to have if you need it, but uh, it probably won't be used that often if you just want to get quick tables generated. Uh, so just to sum up, these are a bunch of opt functions that really just wrap together a bunch of tab options calls into a convenient interface. And uh, the great thing is they can be used along with you know, tab options, tab style, and really just set some quick, quick settings for the table. And uh, sometimes they're all that you need. Yeah, um, so these last two modules, I'm at the end of both. And these are the shortest ones. And so I guess we can say that this is pretty much done right now. I, I, but I'm free for as long as you want to answer questions. Uh, we can go over things. Just let me know what should be gone over, what questions you have, and I'll, I will answer them for as long as it takes. Oh, one more thing I should add oh. is that there is an exercise file as well, uh, this right here, where it has uh, even more examples for the last. Um, well, it just has basically, it's inviting you to use this table and to use opt functions on that, that table. Um, great, that's great to hear. <laughs> Good, I know, I know it was a lot of talking uh, and uh, there was, it wasn't a traditional workshop in lots of ways where you know, there's more time and, and things like that, but I hope it was helpful. Um, and like I said before at the beginning of this workshop, this is available as, um, if you just look, right, I think it's right here. Yeah, GT Workshop 2020, the link is right here for the exact RStudio Cloud project. Once you go in there and log in, you have to have to log in for RStudio Cloud, it's free. Once you do that, it's will copy into your own personal workspace and you can modify it at will. Um, and, and play with GT, which is, is great. And then you get some good ideas going and uh, try to use it for your own data. Oh, uh, for op opt CSS, what parameters can be adjusted? Yeah, that's, um, that's a whole sort of article and, and uh, book chapter in itself. The best way to discover that is to go into the inspector, have a GT table open, either in the viewer, um, I don't know this, but in RStudio, which is right here, which I don't have. There it is. You can make any table, um, so I'm just gonna say exhibit. GT, just to have the simplest table. Oh, I have to do this, of course. Um, GT, then run that again. If you go in here, you can run the inspector. You just go to right click, inspect element. And this is how you discover things. It's a little bit complicated because there's so much there. But if you just use this tool right here and hover over, and the, the key thing is to position this to the, to the right. So you can, it's actually kind of tough. Move this over here, position this to the right so you can see um, 
which classes you have in the table. So I'm gonna do this again and hover over. And we see here we have, if I just click, if you look to the right, we have GT row, GT left. That's how you discover different classes. And uh, you, you'll, you'll find other ones too, as you look through like GT call headings, GT table. Um, and then there are all the settings. If you go into GT row, it's got these settings. So you can just copy these out, change the values back into like, you know, into opt CSS. So you can copy or just look at them. It's laid out just like this. So the key thing is to have this, which will be labeled something nicely. This is your table ID. You'll give it a nice label, not something random. You'll give it a class, and then you'll change the values inside opt CSS. And this is great because you can play the values here too. You can turn them off and on and see the value. If you look on the left, you'll see that things are changing, the padding. So you can quickly play the values here, even change like, you know, PX values. And then once you're satisfied with this, you can translate these, put them into opt CSS, and then really uh, radically affect the table. It's really, really cool. Um, but I do get that it's, it's, a, it's a large ask to start playing with the developer tools. But once you start, it, it becomes, you know, once you have the tools, and you know what they are, it's a, it gets a bit easier. Yes, yes. I mean, um, tons of examples. Um, one thing I wanted to have was as many examples as possible so that you can sort of see your own data in these tables. And learning by examples is a great way to go because help by itself or just, there's so many functions in this package. It's really hard to start somewhere. I mean, aside from the GT function, you really just have a, a grab bag of tools that you can use. And having lots of examples is useful because um, you can mix and match them. You can basically use functions in any order that you like, as, as long as you have GT first, of course. Um, but it's very forgiving. Like the GT API won't complain about things in certain orders. Because uh, you're giving a GT a bunch of instructions. And then later on, it builds, it just takes those instructions and makes that table uh, for you. Um, OK. So let me know if you have any more questions. Um, if not, you can probably call this. <laughs> it's up to you. I'll, I'm definitely free to hang around another 20 minutes. Oh, great. Awesome. I have a, I have a question. This is good. Um, package that it's GT to Word. Is there options to export to Excel file already? Oh, well? No, unfortunately not. I mean, that's a, that's a request I've been asked for too, having Excel output. Um, it's not just another workshop. It's another task for me to do. Um, yeah, right now, I, I don't know of any, maybe FlexTable does that though. They could, they might knit to Excel. I have a feeling that some combination of FlexTable officer would do that. I just haven't discovered it yet. Thank you. What I'll do is I'll stop yeah. the recording and then if people aren't comfortable with the recording, maybe yeah. we'll for another minute or two. Sounds great. But thank you so much. This was so interesting. It's like such a big package, but yeah, uh, yeah. I feel like we're all ready to use it now. And <laughs> yeah, I think, I, think, start. I think three hours for a workshop is a sweet spot um, because you know, it, it, it's a lot of stuff. <laughs> but going too long will just you know, destroy your head in a way. It'll give you a headache. Um, 